So we're finally back with part 2 of Vanilla and Royal Differences in Persona 5. The series where we compare most of the even remotely significant differences between the two versions of the game. I'll be the first to admit there's been a, a little bit of a gap in between the first part and this one, but hey, we're here. And more importantly, between the first part and now, there's been an entirely new release of Persona 5 Royal that we need to talk about now. In October of 2022, Persona 5 finally stopped being a PlayStation exclusive and was ported to other platforms. Specifically, Royal was the version that got ported and went from being a PS4 exclusive to now being on Switch, PC, Xbox One, Xbox Series X, and PS5. This new release of Royal has a few changes from the original PS4 version of the game, so I'll be documenting those changes throughout this series as well. But before we get into any of that, allow me to correct some mistakes I made in the first video. In the first video in this series, where I went over the major changes made between Vanilla and Royal, I did make a few errors in said video. They've been corrected in a pinned comment under the video for quite a while now, but I wanted to put them here so more people could see them. Let's start from when I said this in the first video. In Persona 5 Royal, textures and models look better. This is in part due to the fact that the Phantom Thieves models have been ripped from Persona 5 Dancing, rather than being ported over from the original game. My source for this, however, is pretty shaky. For starters, I've seen people who are far more knowledgeable than me on this type of thing say that the models are not from dancing and are rather just higher quality versions of the vanilla models. I don't know enough about the models to personally confirm the validity of these claims, but I'm inclined to believe they're correct. My original source for this claim in the original video was Inverse, but I'm not sure what their actual source is. Furthermore, I had read something in the Megami Tensei wiki that seemed to back up these claims, but I'm not so sure about that anymore, it could have just been the way I was interpreting it. Either way, this is still on me, so I apologize for that, but we're not done just yet. In the first part, I said this about the conditions to unlock the new palace added in Royal. Accessing this palace is only possible if you max out Maruki's confidant. This is something that must be done by November 18th, as that's the cutoff day for his confidant. Well, in reality, you only manually have to get him to rank 8, because rank 9 and 10 will happen automatically if you've gotten him to rank 8. I misspoke here, and honestly, it's a little embarrassing that I did. I say here that you need to get Maruki to rank 8 manually and rank 9 and 10 happen automatically, but you actually have to get Maruki to rank 9 manually and rank 10 happens automatically. The likely reason for this misspeak may have been me getting Akechi and Maruki's confidants mixed up in my head, since Akechi's confidant is a case of needing to get him to rank 8 manually and 9 and 10 happening automatically. The last thing I need to correct is in the first video, I said Savage Shadows are new to Royal. Savage Shadows are the ones with the red auras. Those actually do exist in vanilla, though they have more of a focus in Royal, and we'll get more into that later in this video. And that's about all I think I have to cover from the first video. There were only a few, but I made some mistakes regardless. I apologize. But let's set our sights on what we're going to do now. We'll be going over the differences between Vanilla and Royal in the prologue and Kamashita arc of Persona 5. Here's a warning though, this video will not only have spoilers for the Kamashita arc of the game, but also may have spoilers for future arcs in Persona 5. The reason being, even though we're only covering one arc in this video, the arc may contain references to future events in the game, and I may go in depth on what those events are. And this mindset will be carried throughout every video in this series, so basically, if you haven't played the game and you care about spoilers, I'd recommend not watching these videos just yet. And with all of that out of the way, I think we can finally begin Persona 5 Vanilla and Royal Differences Part 2, the Prologue and Kamashita Arc. So our first differences come before we even get into the game. In fact, we get notable differences before we even get to the main menu. When opening either version of Persona 5, the first thing you're greeted with is a prompt to enable the Thieves Guild network features. Regardless of your answer, you'll get a little animation. In Vanilla, it's just the mask spinning, but in Royal... I mean, after all, it does make sense to start Royal off with just a little bit more flair. The next big change comes directly after this, and anybody who's played both versions of the game would immediately recognize it. The opening videos and songs accompanying those videos are now different. Vanilla's opening is Wake Up, Get Up, Get Out There. Wake up, get And Royal's opening is Colors Flying High. So 
If you've only played one version of the game and you somehow haven't seen the opening for the other one, I'd recommend checking them out because they're both pretty good. After this, we reach the main menu of both games, and once again, they're both different. Vanillas takes place in the Mementos train station while the song Phantom plays. and Royals takes place in the streets of Shibuya while the song Royal Days plays. Royal does add one new option to the main menu called the Thieves' Den, but we'll get more into what that is later in the series when it actually gets introduced. For now, let's finally get into a new game and start the prologue. Our first prologue change comes right at the start. When your teammates speak to you during the prologue, in vanilla they have no portrait. And in Royal, they've added portraits, but they're blackened versions of what they would eventually become. However, a version of this still exists in Vanilla, as when the characters talk during gameplay, there they do have blackened portraits, just not during their dialogue boxes. After beating the first mini-boss in Prologue, you'll be told to keep moving by Futaba. Oh, sorry, by Girl's Voice. Not only is this dialogue now voiced in Royal, but there's also new dialogue added in here, foreshadowing something that's going to happen very soon. Because the new dialogue was added right after the old dialogue, it pretty hilariously results in Futaba telling you to go, and then immediately telling you to wait. Don't worry, I'm taking up everyone's voices. Just go, Joker! Hmm? Wait a sec. What the? I'm getting a weird reading heading your way! Said weird reading is exactly what our next change is going to be, but first let's finish up how this scene ends in Vanilla. In Vanilla, you continue forward and eventually make it past a guard who doesn't see you, continue up the stairs, and make it to the next cutscene. However, when you do that in Royal, you're greeted with another hallway. Once you're here, you're told to use your new grappling hook added in Royal to take an alternate route. And once we do that, we reach the biggest new scene that Royal added to the prologue. Joker, it's her! She's the weird reading I've been getting! My weak self relied on you so much. That ends today. Let's do this, senpai! This new scene introduces one of Royal's new characters added to Persona 5, Kazumi Yoshizawa. After the cutscene, we go into a quick new battle alongside her. And after the battle is over, we finally catch up to where Vanilla is. And that concludes all the differences in the casino section of the prologue, but we're not done with the prologue just yet. During the interrogation scene, we're told to select a difficulty. The difficulties have changed a little bit between Vanilla and Royal, so I'll give a quick breakdown on how they have. And I hope you're ready, because I'm gonna hit you with a bunch of numbers. Starting at safe difficulty, it's been made a little bit more difficult. Though, it's still safe difficulty, which is only really meant to be played if you're just playing the game for the story, so it's still pretty easy. It's been changed by bringing the damage you deal down from 2.0 to 1.6, the XP you gain being decreased from 3.0 to 1.5, and the money you gain being decreased from 5.0 to 1.5. Easy has been made a little, well, easier, with the XP and money you gain on Easy being increased from 1.0 to 1.2. Normal has naturally stayed the same, and every multiplier is still at 1.0. Hard has also stayed the same. And Merciless has been tweaked in a pretty interesting way. The amount of damage you deal has been decreased from 0.8 to 0.65, but the amount of XP and money you gain has been increased from 0.4 all the way to 1.2. That's right, you gain more XP on Merciless than you do on Normal and Hard. It's a little weird to me, to be honest with you. Though, if we're being honest, Royal in general is just the easier version of Persona 5, mostly just because there's a lot of new mechanics at play, and the game hasn't really been balanced to account for all of them. And with that difficulty breakdown out of the way, let's move past the prologue now, and into the Kamashita arc. When we're first introduced to Young and Jaya, when we walk down the back streets, we're all alone. But in Royal, there's a familiar character who walks past us. Well, I mean... She's not familiar yet, but we'll get to know her. Speaking of the goth Dr. Takemi, and more importantly her clinic, I figured I'd also mention that the clinic symbol on the minimap has also changed between games. I couldn't tell you why it's changed, but it has. 
On top of all of that, two scenes that take place on this day that weren't previously voiced in vanilla are now voiced in Royal, those being the scene with the delivery guy outside of Sojiro's house, Well, the flogs in the back alley, so I should make my other deliveries first. And Sojiro coming up to the attic after hearing you clean. What the heck? I heard you making all sorts of noise up here, but I didn't think you were cleaning. After that, we move on to April 10th. For starters, the opening scene of Sojiro saying he's going to drive you to Shujin is now voice. I'll drive you there, but just for today. Let's go. Jeez, men aren't usually allowed in my passenger seat. The scene with Sojiro after you get your student ID from the principal is also now voiced. By the way, if you get expelled now, I won't hesitate to kick you out. Got it? But more importantly, this scene in the car with Sojiro while he's driving you home from Shujin has had a lot of dialogue added onto it. For reference, here's where the scene ends in vanilla. Another accident. So that's why it's so crowded. There's been a lot of those lately. In Royal, however, this dialogue comes after that point. So that's why it's so crowded. There's been a lot of those lately. In fact, there was a real sad one just last month. It happened before you came here. If I remember right, the girl that passed away was only 15. Her parents have got to be just... Now, I did say in the beginning, this video would have spoilers for the entirety of the game, so don't say I didn't warn you on this one. This new line of Sojiro referencing a 15-year-old girl who was apparently the victim of an accident is foreshadowing for a new event in the story of Persona 5 Royal. If you played Royal, you should know the girl he's referencing is Kazumi Yoshizawa. No, not the Kazumi Yoshizawa we met at the beginning of the game, that's actually Sumire Yoshizawa, her sister, masquerading as the dead Kazumi. It's a lot to wrap your head around, I know. The point is, Kazumi Yoshizawa was hit by a car, and this line is referencing said event. I guess I should also clarify that Sojiro incorrectly loops Kazumi's accident in with the train derailment accidents. Though, the reason for those accidents are the psychotic breakdowns. The result of Kazumi's death has nothing to do with those breakdowns. Moving forward, the last changes that happen on April 10th are simply that the scene immediately after you get back to LeBlanc is now voiced, and the phone call later on where Sojiro tells you to flip the store sign is also now voiced. Also, here's something that's present throughout the entire game, but I think this is its first use. In vanilla, it would normally show the regular portrait you'd get when a character is speaking to you, regardless if they were talking on the phone or not. In Royal, they've added it so this has a new UI element, where it kind of uses the background of wherever they're supposed to be. This is present throughout all phone calls in the game, so I figured I'd mention it here. And I have to say, this is quite a relief. It's a personal policy of mine, not to save a guy's number in my phone. Moving on to April 11th, and we delve into Kamashita's palace for the first time. But first, before we get into that, this beginning scene with Sojiro is now voiced. Now you better hurry on out. You're gonna be late if you get lost, country boy. And uh, actually that's it, now we can get into the palace. So one of the major critiques of the beginning portions of Persona 5 is how the tutorial is pretty long-winded and kind of hand-holding. Royal doesn't fix this issue completely, but you can tell there were some changes made to speed up the pacing and alleviate some of the issues. A good example of this is the Arsene Awakening fight. Namely, the fight is a lot more restricting in the vanilla version. Here's a breakdown of how the fight goes down in vanilla. For starters, you're forced to use your persona first. Detest the enemies before you. Change that animosity into power and unleash it! Persona! Then your melee attack. Swing your blade! And then you're finally able to do what you want. Kill them however you want. Run wild to your heart's content. In comparison, in Royal, you're able to do whatever you want straight from the beginning of the fight. This power of mine is yours. Kill them however you want. Run wild to your heart's content. With a UI as intuitive and easily understandable as Persona 5's, it makes sense to just let the player do what they want rather than holding their hand through this one. The tutorial that happens a little further ahead for special actions has also been alleviated just a little bit. In vanilla, you'd get this tutorial right after getting out of Kamashita's cell when you're prompted to jump over this bridge. Hmm? Yes, the very essential tutorial for how to 
pr press X and, and jump over a bridge. Thank you, Persona 5. Regardless, in Royal, it's been moved a little further ahead for when you have to jump over these cages. Yeesh, can we really get across this? On the other hand, there's nowhere else we can try. All right, let's get to hopping. A little further ahead after you meet everyone's favorite, Morgana. What? No! Hot! He ends up teaching you about the Kamashita statues in the palace, which are used for puzzles. That scene is now voiced. How are we supposed to know to do that? Mm, amateur. Come on, let's keep going. And after that, we learn of the auto-recover menu, which has also changed between versions. In vanilla, the auto-recover menu only had the option auto-recover. But in royal, infiltration tools have been added here so you have easy access to them at all times. In vanilla, you had to use infiltration tools through the pause menu. The scene of Ryuji recognizing an injured student is now voiced. I feel like I've, like I've seen what this dude's wearing before. Ah, damn it! I'm too flustered! I can't remember anything right now. And to end the day on a high note, we get chewed out by Sojiro. But in royal, that chewing out is now voiced. Look, just behave yourself. One wrong step and your life is over. You do know what probation means, right? And after that, we're on to April 12th. And of course, like any other day, we have to take the subway to school. In vanilla, we simply just take the subway and walk to school. But in Royal, we get a new scene involving a new character. That character, of course, being Kasumi Yoshizawa, but we don't actually know her name yet. In meeting this character for the first time outside of the prologue, we see a more caring side of her. Oh, wow, what speed. I mean, excuse me, that seat was for this lady. Oh. It's alright. I can understand his position as well. The classroom question for today has changed in Royal, and there's quite a few of these throughout the game that have changed in Royal. Typically, Royal tries to make the question a little bit more relevant to what's going on in the game. Though since there are so many changes to these questions throughout the game, I think I'm only going to mention the most interesting ones in this series, otherwise it would take forever, and they're really not that important. After finishing up with the majority of our school life, An and Kamashita have an uncomfortable interaction together. This interaction is now voiced in Royal. Sorry, I have a photo shoot today. It's for the special summer issue, so I can't afford to miss it. Hey now, being a model's fine and dandy, but don't work your pretty little self to the bone. After that, Ryuji ambushes us outside of school and tells us he wants to go back to Kamashita's castle. Ambush? Now, come on, don't say shit like that. <sighs> Anyways, I want to talk about that castle from yesterday. And go back to Kamashita's castle we do. First things first, we have to learn how to ambush people. This tutorial is now voiced. So, we want to get the jump on him and make the first strike. Okay, got it. Uh, you know you're just going to be watching, right? You don't have a persona. The scene right before we go into the safe room is now voiced, and in this safe room is a good place to show an effect that's changed between Vanilla and Royal. This effect, I believe, is called a kaleidoscope, and it's been changed in Royal to be made more subtle. Not only that, but it just seems to show up less in Royal than it did in Vanilla. It's a small change, but I actually think the Royal one looks a lot better. I don't know, the Vanilla one just looks cheap to me in comparison. Next up, the tutorial for how security levels in palaces work is now voiced, and then we're on to the gun tutorial. Not only is most of this tutorial now voiced where it previously wasn't, but guns in general have been strongly overhauled in Royal. While guns have changed quite a bit, the most significant change probably comes from the way the game handles ammo now. Vanilla Persona 5 met a decent amount of criticism for guns being underpowered. A big reason for this was because the amount of ammo you had in each gun was limited per palace infiltration. Basically, let's say, for example, Joker's gun holds 16 bullets. Between fights, I can use those 16 bullets on any enemies I want, but once I use them all, I don't get any of my ammo back until I leave the palace and come back a different day. Eventually, you do learn how to create an infiltration tool that can also restock your ammo, but it's just a very convoluted process for a weapon that isn't that useful overall. Royal has changed the way guns work, making it so your ammo replenishes every single battle. To make it so this change wouldn't end up being overpowered though, guns now hold less ammo than their vanilla counterparts. For example, let's say Joker's gun in Royal has 8 bullets. I can use those 8 bullets in battle, and the next time I get into another battle, I'll have those 8 bullets replenished. Also, in the vanilla game, guns themselves could actually land critical hits. 
In Royal, this has been removed, so you can no longer get free critical hits from your gun. It's only fair, considering how much more you're going to be using guns in Royal compared to Vanilla. The dialogue in the gun tutorial has also been changed to explain why bullets can replenish every battle within the game's lore. And to be honest with you, this explanation actually feels really natural considering the whole cognitive world thing. As Morgana says, this is a cognitive world, so as long as our opponent sees it as real, it becomes such. Because they recognize it's a gun, your ammo capacity is limited in battle, but your enemies are expecting you to come at them with guns loaded, so your ammo's replenish in every new fight. One more thing that isn't 100% relevant, but I figured I'd mention here, is that while I don't plan to cover every single affinity or weakness change in this series, I just wanted to point out that Jack-O-Lantern, or Pyro Jack, is weak to gun and vanilla and it just feels wrong. Do you know how many games Pyro Jack is weak to gun in? Well, to my knowledge, it's just Vanilla Persona 5 and Devil Summoner 2. Look at this man. Does he look like the type who would fall so easily to a gun? I don't think so. Anyways, the All Out Attack tutorial is now voiced. And also, there's been a change with the All Out Attacks. Well, more accurately, there's been a change to the All Out Attacks in the 2022 port of Persona 5 Royal specifically. The 2022 releases of Persona 5 Royal have this fade effect on the all-out attacks. In my video going over the downgrades in the new 2022 port, I mentioned that the Switch version does not have this fade, and I presumed that the reason for that was because the Switch version is still at 30 FPS like the original PS4 version was. Though I recently found footage of the game on Xbox One, which also runs in 30 FPS, and it does have the fade there, so now I'm just really confused. So, while I initially assumed that this was an accessibility change made not to trigger people's epilepsy on higher frame rates, perhaps it has nothing to do with frame rate and it's just there not to trigger people's epilepsy in general. Basically, all you need to really know is this is an accessibility change made to not trigger people's epilepsy. However, despite this being kind of an accessibility change, there's no way to disable it. In general, the new 2022 release pieces of Persona 5 Royal have made a few accessibility changes, and this is one of them. That was a lot of info, but now we're gonna chill out by leaving the palace after Ryuji awakens and form a bond with him. This unlocks the first confidant in the game, and almost all the confidants in the game have changed at least a little bit in Royal. Specifically, most confidants now have an extra rank that usually takes place in the form of a phone call, and a significant portion of confidant abilities in Royal have been reworked. Though I want to focus these videos more around the main story of the game, so I'll be leaving confidants for their own video at the end of this series. Moving on, there's a new scene featuring Akechi and Sai that takes place after you go to the beef bowl shop with Ryuji. This scene is so brief, I'll just show it to you in its entirety. So, about this plan to take down Kamoshida. Ah, right. I assume this scene exists for a few reasons. To show that Sai was closer to the Phantom Thieves than she initially knew, to foreshadow Akechi, and to exemplify the fact that Ryuji and all the other Phantom Thieves should really keep their voices down in public about Phantom Thief business because enemies could be lurking anywhere close. Moving on to our last scene of the day, the ending scene with Sojiro is now voiced. Though there are still some things that are introduced this day that are different. For starters, the background of your phone can now change with the season. It's currently April in game where we are, so our phone is now spring themed. And now we have to talk about the DLC or bonus content. Let's start by going over the DLC that the vanilla game had. The vanilla game added a lot of costumes to the game, as you can see on screen now, as well as DLC personas. The DLC personas the vanilla added to the game were Ariadne, Asterius, Izanagi, Kaguya, Magatsu Izanagi, Messiah, Orpheus, Thanatos, and Tsukiyomi, as well as Piccolo versions of all of those personas. When Royal released, it would include all of the DLC from Vanilla for free, but then add DLC of its own. Royal would add even more costumes and personas to the game. The personas Royal added were Female Orpheus, Athena, Izanagi no Okami, Picaro versions of all of those, and Raul. Yes, Joker's third awakening Raul was locked behind DLC. It also added a DLC named the Battle Bundle, which added extra challenge battles to the game. The most interesting of which being the fights against the protagonists of Persona 3 and 4. Now there's the case of the 2022 port. The 2022 port of the game, for starters, is the only one to give you an actual tutorial of how to get the DLC. But the DLC is no longer referred to as DLC, it's now referred to as bonus content. This is because in the 2022 versions of the game, the DLC is completely free. 
Also, since the port's release, the original PS4 version of the game should also have the DLC for free now. Also, the 2022 port has removed one of the DLCs from the game. Specifically, the Devil Summoner Raido Kuzanoa DLC has been completely removed from all versions of the 2022 port. This is because, oddly enough, the 2022 port of Persona 5 Royal has brought in some censorship changes that were previously exclusive to the South Korean and Chinese versions of the game. If you want to learn more about why the DLC was removed and the circumstances around the removal, watch this video that I made a few months back. Also, the PS4 version of Persona 5 Royal allowed you to import data from the vanilla version of Persona 5 into the game. Not to actually use that data in the game, mind you, no, you can't actually import the saved data to use it in Persona 5 Royal, but rather, just to acknowledge that you did play Persona 5 vanilla, they would give you a few items in the DLC box. This has been completely removed from any version of Persona 5 Royal that isn't on the PS4, due to the fact that vanilla Persona 5 only shares a platform with Royal on the PS4. Though, the bonuses they give you are so inconsequential anyways, I doubt anyone's really gonna miss them. But anyways, back to the main point. Yeah, there was a lot of paid DLC. If you're one of the people who got into P5R post-2022, you should be glad you didn't have to pay for any of it, because honestly, it wasn't really worth it. Besides the fact that the DLC personas are incredibly powerful, but that might be another reason not to buy them because they're a little too powerful. Anyways, now we can finally move on to April 13th. There really isn't much that happens today besides some new voice scenes, so let's just get them over with. The students talking about the volleyball game on the way to school is now voiced. Just look at how banged up the volleyball team is. What the hell goes on during their practices? After the volleyball game, Ryuji talking about the game and talking about how he should find the students who were injured by Kamoshida is now voiced. That asshole's acting like a king over here too. Get to know each other better, my ass. It's just a one-man show for him to stroke his ego. Oh, oh, and how he acted like he was worried about Mishima. Oh, what an abusive D-bag. <sighs> well, anyways. Now is our chance to go look for the guys we saw were slaves yesterday. And the scene where you find the first student who was a slave in Kamashita's castle is now voiced. Don't try and hide it, we already know! You know? You have proof. Well, uh, I... This is ridiculous. That injury ain't normal, and he still won't fess up! Told you it'd be brief, and now we're on to another brief day, April 14th. Once again, it's just more scenes that are voiced, so we'll just go over it very quickly. For starters, talking to Shiho in the school is now voiced. Um, this might not be any of my business, but don't let the rumors get to you, okay? I'm glad to hear that. My best friend is often misunderstood too, all because of her looks. Uh, sorry. I didn't mean to drag on like that. After chasing on down in the subway station, god that sounds bad without context, regardless, after you chase her down, her dialogue is now voiced. Why? Why do you keep worrying about me? <laughs> what the heck? I really don't get you. And at the end of the day, Sojiro getting mad at you for coming home late is also now voiced. Ooh, look at the time. Seriously, think about how I feel having to stay up here waiting for you. Hey, guess what time it is? Time for the next day. April 15th. For starters, the conversation you hear at the beginning of the day of two students gossiping has new dialogue added onto it. Specifically, the important new line is, Oh, that reminds me. Apparently a guest is coming to the school today. Some young guy, I think. This is alluding to Takato Maraki, one of the new characters added in Royal. We'll talk a little bit more about his relevance of coming to the school today a little later. For now, how about we get into our palace infiltration for the day. For starters, the speech that Shadow Kamashida gives to his guards is now voiced. Strengthen the security, kill him on sight. I'll reward whoever brings me their heads. Praise be to King Kamashida! Surprised this one wasn't voiced in vanilla, the scene of Morgana explaining that you're special since you can wield multiple personas is now base. Based. Voiced. Hold on. <laughs> only one heart exists per person. So normally a person can only have one persona. Incredible! That ability will give us a huge advantage in battle. Going further into the palace, On awakens to her persona. After said awakening, there's a new scene when the group comes back to the real world. At first, the scene may seem largely unremarkable and not even very important, but looks can deceive and taking a look at the background of this scene will reveal why. Hidden in the background is something that will gain relevance seven in-game months from this point. We overheard a student earlier in the day say that there was a guest coming to the school today. 
Well, looking at the background of this scene, we can now infer that that guest was none other than Takato Maruki. This is Maruki's first in-game appearance in the story, and it's quite an important one. It's important because with the angle Maruki's at, he can see the Phantom Thieves returning to reality from the metaverse. In rank 10 of Maruki's confidant, he will point to this moment as the first time he suspected Joker of being a Phantom Thief. To be entirely honest, it was all the way back in April, when I first came to speak with the principal here about providing counseling to you students. I actually witnessed the moment when you came out of an individual's reality like I'd mentioned. You suddenly appeared in the back alley near the school. I believe Sakamoto-kun and Takamaki-san were with you? Takamaki-san appeared to be extremely exhausted. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Maruki even lists this as the reason why he approached Joker and his group of friends initially, hoping that it will help him complete his research. So if you butterfly effect everything that happens because of Maruki seeing the thieves here, it's actually it's scarily important. It was during that time I happened to come across the Phantom Thieves of Hearts fresh from a mission. My heart began to dance. I thought to myself, maybe I could complete my research if I were to have your assistance. That's why I approached you and your group of friends in the first place. Moving on, shortly after this scene, we automatically start On's Confidant. As brief as the dialogue Sai gives for On's Confidant, it's actually been completely rewritten in Royal. I doubt something as dangerous as your group could have been pulled off with orthodox methods. It wouldn't be odd if you had someone that was proficient in deceiving the eyes of others. If you're listening, then answer me. A group like yours must have relied on subtlety and misdirection. Otherwise, you'd never survive. Some of you might even have been hiding behind a public face their entire lives. If you're listening, then answer me. I mean, realistically, these are both accurate descriptions of On's usage in the group, and they're not even that different from each other. I just figured it was worth mentioning regardless. Something so closely related to confidants like this would normally go in my confidants video that's going to be at the end of this series, but because On's confidant starts as a part of the main story, I figured I'd include it here. Also, when it comes to text changes in general, I haven't compared too many of the text differences between Vanilla and Royal in this series so far be them because of localization or just overall text changes in the original script, because small changes here and there are made all the time between Vanilla and Royal, and I don't think mentioning literally every single one of them is very beneficial. So while I'll be mentioning this one, I'm going to try to keep it only to the more interesting dialogue changes. I feel like this day's been going on forever at this point, and there's still more. Don't worry, it's brief. All we have to talk about now is the fact that Takemi's introduction at the end of the day is now voiced. Hey, lay off the customers. Sorry if he was rude, Doctor. I don't mind. She's the head doctor over at that clinic down the street. Rumor has it she gives pretty crappy examinations and sells some weird homemade medicines on top of that. At least, that's what I've heard. I haven't been there myself. They should really just leave her alone. It's not like she's getting in the way of their lives. Okay, are we done? Is there anything else? Oh, yeah, there's this at the end of the day now. It's cute, I like it, and thank God now we're on April 16th. Let's hope this day is a shorter one. And, but it is! This is quite a short day, but there's still a decent amount to talk about. For starters, let me get something out of the way here, because this is the first time it happens in the game. When walking to school, in Royal, you'll be greeted by another classmate more often. I know this isn't that big of a deal, but they bothered to add it, so I'll bother to mention it. Though, the reason I'm pointing it out here so definitively is so I don't have to point it out in the future every single time it happens, since... Quite frankly, this just isn't worth pointing out every single time. The hideout scene where the thieves discuss that they'll need weapons and medicine for palace infiltration is now voiced. You talking about weapons? Oh, I know a kick-ass place. In that case, you can handle that side of things. The only other thing would be stocking up on medicine. Fatigue is unavoidable in a palace. And the scene where Joker goes to Takemi's clinic is also now voiced. I'm gonna prescribe you some pain relievers, okay? Actually, I still need to restock those. So let's go with sleeping pills instead. Sleep is the best medicine anyway. And if you've played both versions of the game, you might have noticed a difference in Takemi's voice. While her Japanese voice actor remains unchanged between Vanilla and Royal, her English VA has changed between games. In Vanilla Persona 5, she was voiced by Kirsten Potter. I don't want the general public to know about my original medicines. So you're strictly prohibited from disclosing what happens here to anyone. Understood? 
In Royal, however, her voice actor is now Abby Trot, who also did Takemi in the English dub of Persona 5 The Animation. I don't want the general public to know about my original medicines. So, you're strictly prohibited from disclosing what happens here to anyone. Understood? According to TV Tropes, the reason the voice actor change was made was because Kirsten Potter had moved away and couldn't reprise her role as Takemi. They source Alara Post, the English voice actor of Kazumi and Sumire Yoshizawa in Persona 5 Royal, as the source for this information, though I couldn't actually find where this information was originally said by her, so take it with a grain of salt. Though when it comes to Takemi's royal voice, her newer voice makes her sound younger, which is also closer to the Japanese take of the character. <laughs> Now, I understand that the voice of the Persona fanbase's favorite goth doctor is a very contentious topic, but I'll give my opinion regardless, I actually prefer Royals. And before anyone can get mad at me for that take in the comments, we're moving on to April 17th. This day is pretty simple, we're gonna go to the Airsoft shop and take on Central Street with Ryuji. A lot of the scenes in Central Street have been expanded, most notably Yoshida, who's now had his speech expanded, as well as now voiced. Here's how the scene plays out in Vanilla. Everyone wake up! This country is twisted! This politician's actually saying some decent things, but not many people are stopping to listen. Eh, people give speeches all the time, plus politics are pretty boring anyways. We're almost there, just don't get lost in the crowd. Yes, in Vanilla, Yoshida only actually gets seven words in himself. For comparison, here's how the scene plays out in Royal. Everyone, wake up! This country is twisted. While Japanese society may appear to be thriving, many young people have not been as blessed as their elders. They have no jobs, no savings, no financial security whatsoever. These young people should be tackling their futures head on, but instead, they're too busy merely trying to survive. People give speeches all the time. Plus, politics are pretty boring anyways. This was probably done to give the player a better impression of Yoshida right off the bat to give them a more engaging reason to do his confidant later in the game. Okay, I know I said I wouldn't mention too many dialogue changes, but this one is like the best one so far, so I have to. Before going into the airsoft shop in vanilla, Ryuji says, Oh yeah, now that we're here, you know anything about military stuff? In Royal, they gave it just a little bit more Ryuji by changing the line to... Oh yeah, uh, before we head in, you know anything about guns and shit? I don't know, it's less formal, it's more Ryuji, I like it. Anyways, once you go inside the airsoft shop and meet a Y for the first time, his dialogue is now voiced. You looking for recommendations? I don't know, just buy whatever looks interesting to you. Ugh, some customer service. Fine, what do you want? An automatic? A revolver? Uh, automatic? Dude, why are you talking about cars now? And since we've just been introduced to a Y, I might as well mention how his airsoft shop has changed as well. In vanilla, raising a Y's confidant allowed you to customize your guns at his shop. The higher you got his confidant, the more types of guns you could customize. Vanilla's customization options are fine, but a little lacking, with you typically only having one or two options to pick per gun, with those options being somewhere between damage, accuracy, or ailment. Royal has overhauled this system while still keeping those same options for customization, now having more of those options as well as having them be more consistent between the guns. There's a far higher amount of variety here, and raising a wise confidant allows for more options in customization as well as a decreased cost. Though they did change the color of the customization button from blue to yellow, uh, it's time to move on. Wait, no, don't move on. I liked it in blue. Look how much better it looks. All the other menus are already in green and purple or yellow, whatever the hell the color is. Look, Atlas, the point is, you always take the things I love away from me. I care about them. No, it's all right. Let's move on. Uh, anyways, the ending scene in LeBlanc where Sojiro is kind of getting angry with the customer is now voiced. The news is saying the driver couldn't even speak when they tried asking him questions. Only an idiot would believe a preposterous story like that. Oh, and sorry, but we're closing soon. <laughs> How rude. This must be why you don't get many customers. And before we go to sleep tonight, we get a tutorial for creating infiltration tools. Between Vanilla and Royal, some infiltration tools have been renamed, removed, or changed, and of course, we're gonna go over them. For starters, the Eternal Lock Pick has been renamed to the Perma Pick. Stealthanol and Covertizer have been turned into one item, now named Calming Aroma. 
Reserve Ammo, an infiltration tool that would restore your party's ammo, has been completely removed from Royal due to the changes in how guns work in Royal, and Element Set and Forces Set have been turned into individual items that you can craft rather than crafting the entire set. And this one should go without saying, but look how much better the UI looks now, with the tools coming out of the tool menu, just giving the menu a little bit more of that Persona 5 flair that the games were known so well for. Okay, finally we can make our way to April 18th, and this is quite an important day. For starters, the Kamishita scene at the beginning of the day is now voiced. That admirable behavior won't do you any good once you're expelled. And right after that, we get a new scene with Kamishita, Kazumi, and Kawakami. Well, it's actually more like two scenes, but they're right after another and they both intertwine, so I'm gonna count them as one. The first part of the scene has Kamishita warning Kazumi to steer away from us since we're such a menace to society. I recommend you steer clear of the likes of him if you have any consideration for your future. Remember the discussion we just had? There are a number of students in this school you shouldn't get involved with. This one's at the top of the list. Which is funny, because even if the things against us were true, we'd still be the second biggest menace in the room right now, wouldn't we, Kamashita? And the second part of the scene has Kawakami commenting on the situation between us and Kamashita and showing off a little bit of her humor. I'm gonna get straight to the point. Did something happen between you and Mr. Kamashita? I don't think so, especially after that little exchange just now. Mr. Kamoshida has a real close eye on you. Apparently you've been getting involved with Sakamoto-kun. You seem acquainted with Yoshizawa-san as well. Maybe you're just naturally drawn to athletes? Sorry, bad joke. <laughs> and after that, the mission starts and we can finally start Kamoshida's palace. Going to the hideout for the first time after the mission starts, the scene here is now voiced. I uh, think I get it now. We just gotta find the treasure, yeah? Pretty much. There's just a lot we won't know until we go in. And then after that, it's into the metaverse. Okay, let's go. The first thing I want to talk about while we're here is actually a new non-DLC outfit you can wear in the metaverse. A new non-DLC metaverse outfit you can wear in Royal is the tracksuit. And speaking of the tracksuit, it's actually gone through a very minor redesign in Royal. Comparing the two, in vanilla, you can see the tracksuit has a more arrow-like design in vanilla, while in Royal, the arrows on the tracksuit have been changed to look more like straight lines. I probably slightly prefer the vanilla design here, considering it has a little bit more flavor, but honestly, they're both so similar, it makes me question why they made the change in the first place. There's a new forced encounter in Kamashita's palace that acts as a baton pass tutorial fight. Baton pass is but another mechanic that is changed in between vanilla and royal. In vanilla, to unlock baton pass on a party member, you'd have to rank up their confidant, usually to at least rank 1. In Royal, Baton Pass is innate, and any party member has it straight from the get-go. Baton Pass in general has been buffed, and can even be upgraded later in the game to be buffed even further. Though we'll get more into the details of that later in the series when that feature actually unlocks. Here's something that's very, very minor, but I somehow picked up on it, so I figured it was worth mentioning because it's a very weird change. When near some of the windows in Kamashita's palace, you can hear this sound effect. For some reason, even though the visual effect is still in Royal, the sound effect has been entirely removed. It's a shadow! Watch out, Joker! God, the game really feels hollow without any music, doesn't it? Anyways, here's a truly unforgivable change. In vanilla, when walking on the chandeliers in Kamashita's palace, you get jump scared by a shadow. I'll reveal your true you? form. But in Royal, for some reason, they had the audacity to get rid of Jump Scare Shadow. There is a mod to restore him on PC, though, if you're heartbroken over it. One more thing that is a small visual change that goes a long way because you're seeing it throughout pretty much the whole game in palaces. The visual effect around safe rooms you may know actually didn't exist in vanilla. It's new to Royal. Here's a quick side-by-side -side comparison of how the safe rooms look between each game.
Next up, the East Building second floor has changed quite a bit in Royal, mostly due to these new lever puzzles that are now in the area. For starters, let's go over how this area looked in Vanilla. In Vanilla, there were these two long rooms with two long tables in them. These rooms were filled to the brim with patrolling shadows, and the goal of these rooms was to either sneak past all of them and make it into the next room, or choose to fight all of these shadows and escape with your life. In Royal, you'll be taking a break from fighting shadows for a little bit to do these new puzzles instead. The first lever puzzle is incredibly easy, and I assume its only reason for existence is to make sure the player understands how Third Eye works. There are four levers in this room, two marked with Third Eye, and two that are not. Pulling the ones that are not marked with Third Eye do nothing, and pulling the ones that are marked with Third Eye seemingly do nothing until you pull both of them, which opens the door and completes the puzzle. Though, Royal adds a second puzzle right after that, this one a little bit more complicated but still involving the levers. All of the levers in these rooms open one set of doors but then close another set. Really, all the player needs to figure out here is which levers the player should be pulling and which levers they shouldn't be pulling, given where they are in the puzzle. It can be a little intimidating at first, but becomes pretty easy once you figure out what the puzzle's all about. And finishing up this puzzle allows us to continue with the palace once more. Overall, I appreciate the addition of these puzzles in Royal. Even if the first puzzle is incredibly easy, I still think the small detour from combat is worth it to have a little bit more puzzle-oriented gameplay. Especially considering the fact Vanilla goes through all this effort to introduce these levers just to use them very scarcely. Okay, here's the thing about game design that I don't like, so I'm really glad they got rid of it in Royal. The big green glow around the vent to tell the player where they very obviously have to go has been removed in Royal. I appreciate this because hand-holding the player to this extent is just absurd, mostly because it gets rid of the player's need to use even basic critical thinking skills to figure out this, quite frankly, very obvious puzzle. And while we're on the topic, the conversation that happens inside the vent is new, and the mini-boss that you fight after coming out of the vent is also new. Well actually, the fight still goes down the exact same. See, this mini-boss is the Begging for Life tutorial. For some reason, even though this tutorial goes by very quickly, they change the shadow that you fight from an Incubus to Jack-O-Lantern. Coming up in this large spiral staircase room that leads to the third floor of the East Building, in Vanilla, you do exactly what you'd expect to do, which is just walk up the staircase and move on. In Royal, however, oh no, the staircase is destroyed! Maybe this would be a good time to introduce the grappling hook. That's just a little something I've been working on in secret. The grappling hook lets you zip to hard-to-reach locations in a flash. You'll see what I'm talking about when you test it out. Go ahead, give it a try. See it. Man, oh man, this is amazing! This is amazing! Morgana seemingly pulls his grappling hook out of his ass, and then we use it to grapple on to the staircase and move on as normal. Funnily enough, the inclusion of a grappling hook in Royal actually makes Joker more consistent with his appearance in Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. For those somehow uninformed, Joker is a DLC character in Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. He was added to the game in April of 2019, a few months before Persona 5 Royal's Japanese release in October of 2019. In the game, Joker uses a grappling hook for his up special. Though, this being before the release of Persona 5 Royal which added said grappling hook, this inclusion was a little odd as the only place he uses a grappling hook in vanilla Persona 5 is in some of the menus. Now moving away from the subject of grappling hooks, the layout of the book puzzle in Kamishida's Palace where you have to obtain the King, Queen, and Slave books has now been changed. For starters, you find the slave book in a room connected to the hallway before where the rest of the book puzzle is. In Royal, this hallway and room have been completely removed, and instead, the spiral staircase we talked about earlier connects directly to the larger book puzzle room. The locations of the last two books in Vanilla are directly across from each other in two rooms in the larger book puzzle room. In Royal, you'll find the slave book in a new room in the book puzzle room close to where the safe room has been moved. You'll find the queen book in the same spot it was in Vanilla, but in place of where the king book used to be, you'll now find the beefcake book there instead. This is a new book added in Royal, and we'll get into its functionality a little later. The king book has been moved to the same room where you place all the books to finish the puzzle. Once finishing the puzzle, the scene with the crew commenting on the contents of Kamashita's hidden room and finding a map, as well as Kamashita's medal, is now void. Ugh, the hell is this room? There are tons of pictures of Suzui in here. Wait, it's all pics of her? 
I feel even more motivated to do this now. I'm sure it'll feel awful, but we should search this room. Is this... a metal? Wait, there's something under the metal, too. It's a different map from the one we have. This is lucky. Let's take it with us. After finishing up in this room, there's a new tutorial mini-boss you have to fight. This tutorial focuses on a new type of shadow Adeline Royal named Disaster Shadows. A Disaster Shadow is a shadow that drops an item and explodes when killed. But if attacked and not killed, it counterattacks with an extreme amount of force. Unrelated to this mini-boss, but earlier in the book puzzle room, you're also given a tutorial for Savage Shadows. Savage Shadows actually do appear in vanilla Persona 5, however there's a much stronger emphasis on them in Royal. Savage Shadows are effectively incredibly strong regular shadows. They also can't be negotiated with unless they're brought to low health. Now, if you remember a little earlier during the book puzzle, we obtained a book new to Royal named the Beefcake Book. Well, we never went over what its actual purpose is, but if you put it in this bookshelf at the back of the room, you get... A protein. You know, typically I'd say it's a pretty lame reward for going out of your way to obtain it, but to quote a wise man, I've been waiting for this. Also, before we move on to the next area, let's talk about a change to the security alert system. In vanilla Persona 5, when you reach 99% alert, you get kicked out of the palace. <laughs> we should give up for now. In Royal, the alert goes all the way up to 100%, but you don't get kicked out of the palace anymore. Shadow, what do you want to do, Joker? Take this! <sighs> the head Shadow's bad news. To accommodate for this, though, when starting a palace, the security meter now starts at 40% rather than zero. Overall, good change though. I say if you want to risk roaming the palace at max alert, you should be able to do so. Moving on, the scene introducing the Archangel mini-boss is now voiced. You will pay for foolishly defying King Kamoshida with your lives. I knew this would happen. Well, we don't have a choice. Let's take it down. And after beating said mini-boss, what happens afterwards is now changed. In vanilla, you're ambushed by a bunch of shadows and need to fight your way out to continue with the palace. In royal, you're still ambushed, but instead you use your grappling hook to get to the top and make it fully past the ambush. I don't really like this change. I mean, it kind of defeats the point of the ambush, and I never felt it was really too unfair in vanilla or anything. Sure, you might have to think a little quickly, but you still have a good amount of time to hide and use stealth tactics before a shadow sees you. Though, perhaps there is a reason this is so lame. Perhaps this was originally intended to be something more. At the very least, there was definitely going to be something more involving this statue of Kamashita. For starters, let's get out of the way that the design of the statue has changed between vanilla and royal. In vanilla, Kamashita's statue has both of his arms up reminiscent of some godly imagery. In Royal, instead he just has one arm up holding a volleyball. This change was likely made to accommodate for a now unused event that was going to take place on his arm. This event was shown very briefly in an early trailer for Persona 5 Royal. <laughs> The unused event would have you lowering Kamashita's chin in an event to set off some sort of trigger. Upon realizing the chin on the statue is too heavy, you'd instead kick his face or chin, whatever, to finally get it to lower. This would unlock a door. Something to suggest that we would be using the grappling hook to go on top of this statue instead is the very, very brief showing we get of Joker seemingly landing on the statue in the trailer. Since he seems to be landed from some sort of elevated height, I would assume that we grapple hook up here, but it's a very, very brief amount of footage. In the end, however, this event would go entirely unused, and the only interaction we have with this statue in the final game is using the grappling hook to get away from this ambush. 
Exploring further into the East Building, we can find a new room that wasn't previously in vanilla. However, it looks difficult to get to, as there's a gap in between where we currently are and where the room is. However, by once again pulling out our grappling hook, we should have no problem. This room has an ominous looking door, and inside an ominous looking skull. N no not that skull, the, the other one. This skull is named a Will Seed, a new item added in Persona 5 Royal. What's a Will Seed, I may hear you asking? <laughs> well... Palaces are locations that grew distorted from their original forms due to their ruler's cognitions. When such distortions coalesce into form, this is the result. I call it a Will Seed. Distortions coalesce into Will Seeds? Should I try explaining that again? And just forget it. That's a will seed. Moving on. I'll leave you with that explanation for the time being, and we'll go more in depth on it a little later on. Just know for now that there are three will seeds hidden in every palace, and they'll definitely be worth finding. Next up, let's compare the roof section of Kamashita's castle in both vanilla and royal. In vanilla, a bunch of savage shadows spawn on the roof, and you have to use stealth tactics to get around them to get where you need to go. In Royal, the Savage Shadows still spawn on the roof, but the approach you take can change. You see, in Royal, and this may give you deja vu from earlier, but you can just use the grappling hook to get past this entire section pretty much scot-free. Now, to be fair, this one is optional, and if you really want to test yourself, you can just stealth around them, but there isn't really too much of an advantage to doing this. In fact, it's far slower. I feel a little bit similarly to this as I did the other grapple hook section a little bit earlier. It's a little unfortunate that they got rid of all these stealth sections when they were really cool, but I feel a little bit better about this one because admittedly this shot is also really cool. The wall section that comes directly after has been expanded. Most notably, after scaling the highest part of the wall, you'll be met with the palace's second will seed. Once you reach the second part of Kamashita's castle, in both versions of the game, you'll be met with this elevator. Though, in vanilla, after going down, you'll start to realize that there really isn't too much to do down here. You can go through the Kamashita painting to get back to the central hall, but then you'll realize that there really isn't anything to do here either. Or you can choose to try to go down this second elevator, but hold on, actually, it's not here. We have to call it up. After calling it up, we're met with a shadow and a chest and literally nothing more. Can't go down the elevator, can't use it, doesn't lead anywhere. That's literally all there is to this entire area. Now let's compare this to Royal. In Royal, you of course once again go down the elevator, and let's go try the other elevator we talked about a little earlier that just had a chest and a shadow in vanilla. Well, we can try it, but it doesn't work. But what if we try going through the picture of Kamashita again? Once again we can go through it, but the more interesting part is if we go to our left, there's a new room that's been added. This room has a lever in it, and when you pull it, it gets some gears moving that make the elevator function. And once we go down, we can get into this new room. It's a pretty small room, all things considered. There's a nice waterfall, but the most important part is at the end we can get to our third will seed. There's a mini boss guarding this will seed, specifically a Slime Mara mini boss, as every third and final will seed in a palace has a mini boss guarding it. Defeating the mini boss and obtaining the third and final will seed in this palace, we get our first will seed accessory, the Crystal of Lust. To explain what these will seed accessories are, effectively, every palace, with the exception of the Memento Steps and Clipoth World Palaces, have three will seeds in them. Collecting all three of these will seeds will give you an accessory named Crystal of and then whatever deadly sin the palace is based on. Kamashita's is of course Lust, so from this palace we get the Crystal of Lust. The accessories on their own can be okay, but they won't reach their full potential until we can upgrade them a little later in the game. However, we won't get to that aspect of it in this video, as that doesn't happen until the next arc in the game. For now, just know that the ability of the Crystal of Lust accessory is that it grants the wearer the ability to cast the healing spell Diorama. Is it, is it Diorama? Diorama? I feel like I should know this. Regardless, to be honest with you, even without this being upgraded, it's still a pretty useful accessory. This is a skill that none of our party members are going to learn until a little later in the game, so having the ability to cast it so early can be quite useful. But hey, really breathe in these Persona 5 Royal exclusive visuals. This is vanilla footage on screen. But how could I possibly be in this Royal exclusive room in Persona 5 Vanilla. Well, I typically want to keep on used content to a minimum in this series as it quite frankly deserves its own, but since it's so closely relevant to what we're talking about, 
Maybe just this once. This waterfall room that has been given the task of hosting the third will seat in Kamoshida's palace was actually initially going to be in vanilla Persona 5 as well. Obviously with a different purpose since will seats didn't exist in Persona 5 vanilla. What purpose this room would have served in vanilla is unclear because as it stands it's pretty much just an empty loop with nothing in it. However, perhaps we can get a better idea of what this room would have been if we use mods to go out of bounds. Using mods to go out of bounds we can find more unused geometry placed by the developer when they were testing ideas for what this room would have been. To be honest with you, it's all a little too unfinished to be able to tell what they were really going for with this room, but I'll just lay out what's here and you can make your own inferences. For starters, we have this very threatening looking spiked roof that would have dropped down on the players if some conditions probably weren't met, or maybe we would have had to escape through these holes on the side of the room here. Where do these holes lead? Uh, w well, um... Nowhere. But presumably they probably would have led somewhere if the devs, you know, f finished the room. There's actually a lot of slopes randomly placed out of bounds here, but the most notable of such is this big long one that I assume you probably would have slid down. After getting down it, you'd find this area with another big hole that you jump down, uh, and, and it leads to nothing. But again, maybe there would have been something more here. Also worth noting that the mood and lighting of this room in vanilla is a lot darker than it is in Royal. I don't know if that's because the lighting just wasn't done yet, or this really was the original vision of the room, but honestly, I actually like this vibe more than the one we got in Royal. Regardless, this room was definitely going to be in the same spot it is in Royal, because not only do we come down into the room through the same elevator that we do in Royal, that same elevator that only had a shadow and a chest on it in vanilla, but when leaving the room, we're also brought into that exact same spot we'd be at if, well, we came out of the elevator back into the original hidden room. Continuing in Kamashita's palace, we're tasked with needing to find two keys that guards hold to move on in the palace. The second guard you have to fight for the second key is up in a higher area now, probably to force the player to need to use their grappling hook to get up there. The second guard miniboss fight is also now used as the technical attacks tutorial. Another one of these? That shadow has a lot of health. This will be a pain. Joker, I taught you how to strike your opponent's weaknesses, right? If you could blind it or put it to sleep, you'd have an easier time doing real damage to it. After using both keys and moving further into the palace, the next room you'll encounter in vanilla is this big room with these Kamashita statue heads which creepily follow your movements around. Looking around the room further, you'll eventually find an appearing staircase, but before you can go onto it, you'll be ambushed by a Slime Mara miniboss. After defeating it, you're free to continue and move into the throne room. In Royal, after using both keys to move on, you'll also move into the room with the Slime Min- With the With the The room with the- What? It's- It's gone! So presumably, because we already fought the Slime Mara mini-boss in Royal in the new Will Seed room, Atlas must have figured that there really wasn't much purpose for this room being in the game anymore, and, um, com completely axed it. I'm probably not too upset about this, I mean, there really wasn't much to that room besides the mini-boss, but I am gonna miss those Kamashita statue heads that follow your movements. I mean, they're actually pretty ominous, and they don't appear anywhere else in the palace to my knowledge. But hey, regardless, the room's removed and we move into the throne room all the same. All that's left now in the palace is to secure our route to the treasure, which is the same in both versions of the game. When coming back from the palace, we of course enter LeBlanc. A lot of the time when you return to LeBlanc, you'll get a text conversation and Morgana will say something afterwards. A significant portion of Morgana's dialogue after those texts is now voiced. The real challenge is coming up. I hope you're ready. If you played Vanilla Persona 5, you're likely very familiar with the fact that Morgana is very stingy on when he lets you leave LeBlanc. Well, those restrictions have been lightened in Royal, thankfully enough, and most of the time you can at least do something within LeBlanc if you can't leave. For reference, in Vanilla Persona 5, when you're locked to LeBlanc, not only can you obviously not leave, but a lot of the time you wouldn't even be able to do something within the cafe. You'd instead be forced to go straight to bed by Morgana. In Royal, even on nights when you come back from a palace, you can typically still do something within LeBlanc. And on top of that, there's also a new activity to do inside LeBlanc. When interacting with the restroom in Vanilla, you'll get Joker's thoughts on whatever's currently going on, typically in the form of a tip or something similar. In Royal, when you go to the restroom, you'll now get a general look at how close you are to ranking up some of your social stats. But on top of that, when interacting with the restroom, there's also a new option you have, and that's to clean up LeBlanc. 
Cleaning up LeBlanc gives you a kindness point, and once you start Sojiro's confidant, also gives you a point in his confidant. The way the crossword puzzle works has also changed in Royal. For starters, there are now 38 different crossword puzzles in the game, rather than Vanilla's 21. Many of the puzzles have been changed, and most notably, for some reason, doing a crossword puzzle in Vanilla used up time, making it a far less desirable thing to do. In Royal, crossword puzzles no longer take up time, so it's basically just a free knowledge stat, as long as you can figure out the puzzle. And after that very long day of venturing through the entirety of Kamoshida's castle, we finally make our way to April 19th. We're sending the calling card today, so there really isn't that much to talk about, besides that the scene when you go to the hideout after completing Kamoshida's palace is now voiced. Couldn't we have just sent one at the beginning of all this? It's not that simple. A treasure won't stay materialized forever. Once the impression is gone, the treasure will disappear. I think it'll last around a day at most. The hell? That's like no time at all! That's literally all we have to talk about today, so let's move on to 4... 420 to fight Kamashita. That was new to Royal, by the way. Yeah, we're getting changes before we even get into the goddamn day! Today we finish up Kamashita's palace by fighting Shadow Kamashita. This boss fight, like most in Royal, has undergone some major changes, though not as many as some other fights between Vanilla and Royal. Still though, there are some interesting things to delve into here, so let's go. The first two phases of the Kamashita fight, that being just the first phase where you attack him until he heals, and the phase where you have to attack the Kam Chalice, are pretty much the same in both versions of the game. You see, the bigger changes in this fight come from after those phases. For starters, as there is throughout the entire game, there's a few dialogue changes that give the characters just that much more personality. You look down on everyone, but you're seriously lame right now. I always saw you as a condescending hotshot, but right now, you're just a pathetic loser. Sorry, but I, I love that line from Ryuji. I had to mention it somewhere. But moving forward, Kamashita's kill shot attacks have been changed in Royal. For starters, Kamashita will use his gold metal spike kill shot multiple times in Vanilla. He'll also start using his kill shot during the phase where you're prompted to steal his crown to weaken him. In Royal, Kamashita will only use his gold metal spike kill shot once, for a reason we'll get into in a second, and it also gets its own phase now. It happens right before the steel crown phase rather than during it. Now, why does he only use his gold metal spike kill shot once? Well, because the kill shots have been, uh, reworked, to say the least. Not so much in damage and their application, but rather how they're given to him. In Vanilla, Kamashita uses his slaves to get his kill shot ball. How dare you keep defying me? Looks like I gotta bring out the big guns. Slaves! Bring over you now, what? In Royal, however, the slaves can't find his ball, and he needs to acquire the help of, um, let's just say, somebody that we might know. I'm so sorry, Kim Kamoshida! I, I have it right here! Mishima! <laughs> oh, and if you ever wanted to see Kamoshida call Mishima shit for brains, that's a very specific request, but here you go. Good Mishima, now pass it to me! Don't tell me you can't even do something as simple as that! Uh, here goes! Behold my greatness! Can't go all out with Mishima providing the backup. And hey, ship for brains! Get off my court! Uh, I'm sorry, King Kamoshida! You know what? I love this change because having cognitive Mishima bring him the ball is pure evil on the developer's parts in the best way possible. As if Kamoshida wasn't hateable enough, but we're not done just yet. I said Kamoshida only uses a gold medal spike kill shot once in Royal but that's because it's not the only type of kill shot he uses in Royal. He has a second kill shot in Royal, the kill shot of love. And who, oh who, brings him the kill shot of love? It's like, get out of here! Hurry up with my damn ball! King Kamoshida, I've brought you your ball, just like you asked. Now, that is a good girl, 
It's Cognitive Shiho Suzui, complete with a bunny outfit and a blowing kiss animation. Jesus Christ. If Mishima bringing Kamashita the ball was evil, then this is pure, unadulterated evil. Functionally, the kill shot of love is pretty similar to the gold medal spike, but it does have a different animation. Yes, King Kamashita. Though, you can actually avoid this kill shot and stop Kamashita from being able to do it. There are two ways of doing this. Either one, reach the threshold of damage on Kamashita before he uses a kill shot of love, skipping to his next phase entirely. Kusona! You just struck me! What you do to do it? one simple thing right! Or two, you have the option of killing Shiho outright. Shiho is weak to literally everything, so she's not that hard to kill, or you could use her for a free baton pass. It's not over yet. Let's go, Captain! This is Shui was useless. Looks like I'll have to give her some special instruction later. One out of one! Kamoshida, I'll never forgive you! Sorry, Suzui. I swear we'll beat that bastard's ass. After this, Kamashita runs out of kill shot balls and he finally goes into his final phase where you can take his crown. What's the matter, slaves? Hurry up and bring me more volleyballs! I can't serve up a kill shot without any balls! Huh? Did I just. Am I really out of slaves? How dare you treat students like slaves? You're scum! Nothing but scum! Kamashita, I'll never forgive you! We won't get anywhere with brute force. After this, we beat the fight like normal, and this piece of shit's finally dealt with. Though, if you'll allow me to delve into unused content territory once more, there's one more thing we can talk about in regards to this fight. Hidden away in the depths of the game's files, there's an unused enemy named EX Kamashita Color Change. Now, there's basically no AI for this enemy, so nothing unique exists for it. Hell, the voice lines are even just regular shadow voice lines. Die already! So it's clear this didn't get too far into development, but its existence proves something. If you couldn't tell by now, this is pretty obviously a reskin of Shadow Kamashita's boss model. But why does it exist? Why was it considered to be put in the game at one point? Well, to my knowledge, besides this very unfinished enemy itself, there isn't anything else in the game's files that would suggest what this enemy would be used for. So, going off the information we currently have, all we can do is theorize. My theory is that this model was made for some sort of extra mode. I doubt it was ever going to be implemented into the main story or even replacing the current Shadow Kamashita boss we have. Since this unused model is new to Royal, it wouldn't be out of the question to assume that the mode it would have been used for would also be new to Royal. Now, it could be part of a new mode that got cut entirely and we have nothing that exists of it, but I think it's more likely it might be involved with a mode that actually did make it into the final game. My theory is that this would have had something to do with the new challenge battle fights added in Persona 5 Royal. The challenge battle mode that currently exists in Royal has you fighting enemies while trying to complete certain objectives. These objectives are the challenge part of these challenge battles and getting a certain amount of points will net you some rewards. Effectively, it's a way of just spicing up the combat of Persona 5 Royal, giving you fights to do that may not be too difficult on their own, but you have to approach them in certain ways if you're trying to beat them properly. My theory is that bosses probably would have been reworked into this mode, maybe a boss rush mode or just more difficult versions of the already existing bosses, maybe even with extra objectives. And hey, maybe to make it a little bit more fresh, why not change the models and reskin them to look a little bit different? Of course, everything I just said is a theory, so I could be completely wrong, but I think that would have been a cool idea and possibly what they were going for. Of course, if we're to run with this theory, well, it never made it into the final game, so clearly this got cut at one point, and the only one existing in the game's files is Kamashita's, so I guess if they were going for this, they never got very far. But just know that in Royal, there is an unused version of the Shadow Kamashita boss, and there was likely going to be something more interesting behind it, but unfortunately, it's just unused content in the end. With all of that out of the way and Shadow Kamashita defeated, it's time to move on to April 21st. After finally defeating Kamashita, we have a little bit of downtime to do whatever the hell we want. 
most of our free time will be spent doing things like our confidants or raising our social stats. As I said before, most confidant differences are going to be relegated to their own videos, so we're not going to be covering too much of that here. So until that deadline's up, we're probably not going to have too many important story events that have changed. However, when it comes to April 21st, there is one little difference. After going to the palace, coming back to the real world, we can now use the Velvet Room in the real world. In Royal, there's a new scene added here introducing challenge battles, a feature we talked about just like 30 seconds ago. We are introducing a new regimen to your rehabilitation in the form of challenge battles. For these trials, we will permit the cognitions of your comrades to fight at your side. <laughs> Cry your tears of joy! Oh, look at this, now we're speedrunning. Let's move on to April 22nd. Hey, you know what? Let's go buy DVDs. To buy DVDs in Persona 5, all you have to do is go to the DVD rental shop on Central Street. That being said, the way this shop works has changed a little bit between Vanilla and Royal. In Vanilla, you can rent as many DVDs as you want at once. However, you have seven days from the day you rent it to return the DVD back to the shop. If you don't return the DVD in seven days, for every day over you go, you're charged an extra 300 yen. This is a part of Persona 5 that, while minor, was criticized a little bit. Not only is just needing to remember to return the DVD to the shop annoying in the first place, but Persona 5 is a game that has a lot of long story events, sometimes story events that go on for several days at a time. Sometimes these story events take up your whole time slot, and sometimes your whole day, especially in vanilla Persona 5 where you can't leave LeBlanc as much. Okay. Hey! With a lot of these story events coming out of nowhere to a new player, it makes it very difficult to return the DVD when you literally can't leave your house. Because of all of that, this system was entirely changed in Royal. In Royal, the rental shop now has an annual subscription, and it's a pretty low price as well. After paying this low price, you can rent DVDs from the rental shop and return them whenever the hell you want. There's no longer any late fees involved, however, to nerf this a little bit, you can only take out one DVD at a time now. On top of that, some DVDs from the rental shop used to give three social stats points in vanilla, but now all of them only give two in royal. Either way, I think most people would agree with me when I say this royal system for the DVDs is definitely better, or at the very least, less annoying. Oh, also, in vanilla, the lady who works at the DVD rental shop is very obviously voiced by Haru's voice actor. Good day. This was changed in royal to a generic man voice instead. What would you like? And now it's time to inch our way closer to the deadline by making our way to April 23rd. Today it's time to go to work, so you know what that means, go to the underground walkway, apply for a job, get it on the spot immediately on the phone, not even a phone interview, just a phone call. Be told our hours are going to work around our schedule, which really means that we can show up to work whenever the hell we want, even if we've missed several months of work. And what job are we working that treats us like a goddamn king and lets us do whatever the hell we want? A uh, convenience store. It's just too good to be true. The convenience store has undergone some changes in Persona 5 Royal, so let's go over them. In vanilla, the only perk of working at the convenience store was, well, getting paid. Your pay could range anywhere from 2300 to 3800 yen. In Royal, the pay you received has been opt and can be anywhere from 3500 yen to 7400. On top of that, you now get social stats for working in the convenience store, and it's hard to believe that you didn't gain any in vanilla. Regardless, you can now get 2-3 to three charm points for working at the convenience store in Royal. In terms of how much you get paid per day, your pay is increased or reduced depending on how well you handle the customers in vanilla. In Royal, there's a new mechanic that decides how much you get paid and even how many social stats you get. Since the convenience store is named 777, when you work on days that end in a 7, there's now a new minigame you can play that will determine how much you're paid. When working on days that end in a 7, you'll know where the barcodes are on certain items that you're scanning. You have to remember where these barcodes are and pick the right one when prompted by a customer. How well you do in this minigame determines how much you're paid and how many points of charm you get. On top of this, also new to Royal, friends can now visit you when you're working at your job, but this actually isn't exclusive to the convenience store. This can happen at many different jobs in the game and even at the laundromat. It gives you some social points with them and in general it's just a cool little feature. The convenience store isn't the only job that's changed in Persona 5 Royal, but we'll go over how the others have changed as we unlock them in our playthrough. Moving on to the next day, April 24th, Sunday. Because it's Sunday, that means the home shopping channel is on, so let's go check out how it's changed between Vanilla and Royal. In Royal, the player has two different sets they can choose from in the home shopping channel. Though, the player can only buy one of them. Even if you have the money to afford both, you can only get one. These sets are filled with a myriad of different types of items, though typically stay to whatever theme the set is named after. In Vanilla, when shopping from the home shopping channel, you only have one option to pick from. 
Furthermore, the option is not a set of items like it is in Royal, it's simply one type of item. The item may come in large quantities, but it's only one type, rather than a whole set like you get in Royal. And quite frankly, on top of this, I just find the items that are sold here in Royal to be far more useful. That's all we got this Sunday, so let's go back to school on April 25th. And as we go back to school, of course the first thing we're bombarded in class with is a question, but this one is presented differently from a lot of the others. This question isn't being asked by the teacher to us, it's being asked by the teacher to Ahn. Though Ahn doesn't know the answer to this question, so she's gonna rely on us for this. This edition of answering questions for Ahn is new to Royal, and gives you charm instead of knowledge points if you get it right. You also get a confidant point with Ahn. And speaking of confidants, let's talk about a feature named Confidant Gifts. In Persona 5, on non-rank up days with certain confidants, you can give them gifts to try to get more points with them. This feature is in both versions of the game, but in vanilla, oddly enough, you could only give it to female social links, but now you can give it to all social links in Royal. That's nice of them. And on to the next day, April 26. We're almost at the deadline. I'm almost free. You want to see how the timeline looks for this video right now? Look at this. This is disgusting. I never want to do this again, and I still have so many more arcs I have to do. Anyway, fuck the transition. Okay, let's just go. April 26. Today starts with a voiced encounter. On comes onto the subway where we are because we're going to school and she tells us that she's worried. So awful just waiting for the results, isn't it? It's so worrying. You too, huh? Uh, of course you are. Sorry for asking such a weird question. Incredible. Okay, next day, April 27th. To start off this day, there's another voice scene in the beginning. This one's actually a fun one. You overhear two students talking about the different things they need to get to get a girlfriend. To be like, it's very obviously working in the social stats in a very non-subtle way. It's pretty funny to listen to. Look, knowledge isn't enough. You need proficiency to adapt on the fly. You also need kindness to be accepted and guts to be honest and direct. Plus charm to draw people to you. The quality of your character says a lot about you. So it's important to better yourself every day. Really? But it takes so much work. But I'll do it if it means I'll get a girlfriend. Speaking of social stats, you can get knowledge points in Persona 5 by doing crosswords when they show up in LeBlanc. Between Vanilla and Royal, many of the questions have changed for the crosswords, and there are many new questions added in Royal. But most notably, in Vanilla, when you do a crossword, it uses up time. And to make matters worse, even if you don't complete the crossword, it still uses up time. Unlike in Royal, where you do a crossword, get a free knowledge point, and then you're free to still do something in that evening slot. I've gotta say, I'm a much bigger fan of Royal's way of doing it, but to nerf this, they did make it so you only get one knowledge point from crosswords now, rather than the two you'd get in vanilla. We skip forward to the 30th now for On to give us another newly voiced encounter in the subway station. We did do what we could. I guess all I can do now is believe. But how strange. I feel a bit better now. Maybe it's because of your composure? And after this, we move on to May 2nd, the day Kamoshida has his change of heart. Surprisingly enough, this event doesn't have any real significant changes, but it is a good reminder of just how far we've come. That being said, we still have seven more arcs to do, so let's not get too excited too quickly. Anyways, when the Kamoshida change of heart is actually reported on the news and shown on the TV in the Blanc, that scene is now voiced. I knew it. This is your school, isn't it? Uh, things might be getting turbulent at school, but you need to just keep your head down, all right? Since we've of course stolen Kamoshida's treasure at this point, which was in the form of a medal, we have to go sell that treasure to fund our change of heart celebration party. Of course, we're gonna sell it to none other than Awai, who gives us a bag on our way out of the shop. The scene where we open up Awai's bag to see what's inside of it is now voiced. Come on, let's open it up. A real gun? Wait. I think it's just a model. And An's phone call at the end of the day about the reception to Kamoshida's change of heart is also voiced. I saw the news. You know, about Kamoshida. It's getting a lot of coverage. Uh, I don't know. The reaction's been bigger than what I was expecting. I guess I'm just... surprised. I don't think we did anything wrong, though. And finally, we arrive to May 5th, our celebration day and the final day of the Kamoshida arc. This day has us celebrating Kamoshida's change of heart at a fancy buffet using the money that we got from pawning off that medal. When going to go get food from the buffet, we overhear some conversations. These conversations are now voiced. It's all rumors made up by school kids anyway. 
If it's gripping news, who cares if it's not true? So they don't believe themselves. But they're making up stories to make the Phantom Thieves seem real. And they're doing this in front of the actual Phantom Thieves. After we eat the food we get for the buffet, that scene is also now voiced. I recommend the seasonal tart. The grapefruit has both alluring sweetness and a tangy sourness. Uh, stop. I don't want to hear about sour stuff. <laughs> uh, this isn't good. I gotta go to the bathroom. Well, me too. Please carry me gently. And funnily enough, this buffet venue is one of the areas in the game that's had some of the most visual overhaul between vanilla and royal. Most of the textures have been overhauled to give it a more regal and refined look, which certainly fits the vibe they're trying to go for with this venue. And this is pretty much the last significant event in the Kamashita arc. After this, we get introduced to our next antagonist, Madarame, and get into his arc, thus putting an end to our wild ride so far. Of course, with this being the first arc in the game, our mission as Phantom Thieves isn't over just yet. In fact, it's only just getting started. I pray that this will probably end up being the longest video in this series, so hopefully I can get the other ones out quicker, because, um, everyone knows about the, the high frequency of uploads this series has had so far. And by that, I mean part one was two and a half years ago, so the point is that hopefully, when covering future arcs, it will be a little bit easier for me to get done a little quicker. I'll still try to keep the videos as detailed as this one to really sell how much they changed between Vanilla and Royal without being too verbose. Speaking of detailed, in this arc alone, we covered eight new scenes that were added in Persona 5 Royal and 45 newly voiced scenes in Royal. And considering this is only one of eight arcs we'll be covering in this series, that tally will be far off by the end of this series, I'm sure. And of course, this doesn't even cover all of the many gameplay and mechanic changes that we also covered in this video. Though there's still going to be tons more to cover in the future, how about for now, we just ride out this celebration to commemorate a job well done. Alright, it's settled! We're gonna catch all these shitty adults by surprise and make ourselves known to the world! The show is over! Oh, and one more thing, and I'll make this quick. I made a Patreon! You can find it in the link in the description, and right now I'm basically just using it like a donation button. There aren't any significant perks for subscribing to it right now, besides the fact that if you like the content and you want to support it and give money to my broadcast, then you can do that. But for the time being, there isn't anything significant that's exclusive to the Patreon, since I want most of the content that I make to be available to the public. Essentially, for the time being, it's basically just a second, more exclusive Twitter feed for me. So if you're interested and enjoy the content, the link is in the description below. YouTube also has this like, I don't know, this button built in, it does things. There's also a like button, you should press that one. We've also got a Twitch, Twitter, all the, all the things, so go, go follow them. We're taking over the world soon, so you're either with us or in our way. And with that, I think I will say goodbye, good night, and to all of- SHUT THE FUCK UP, IDIOTS!